We have been talking about the Lord's Prayer uh, for the last, this is the sixth week. In this week's sermon, I was moved because we all face temptation. But that is not the end of the story because there is deliverance from temptation and failure. Five-year-old little boy came to his dad and said, Dad, I like temptation. And his dad was shocked and he said, carefully, cautiously, he said, what do you mean by that? He said, because temptation is chocolate. His dad was relieved. (laughs) And for most people, there's no arguing with the fact that temptation is chocolate or chocolate is temptation. In fact, that's the word they use most in their most precious desserts. Have you noticed? There'll be the temptation thing. Uh, and they, it, they also use it, um, uh, in various ways in our culture. Temptation does not become in our society what it should be because we look at it and we go, well, that's just another temptation. It's used as a title for desserts and restaurants, used as, uh, the title for novels on Daniel Steele or somebody's books, you know, uh, but the prayer Jesus prayed tells us that temptation runs deeper than the need for chocolate. This temptation he's talking about needs deliverance. We need to be delivered from evil. So the big question is, does God lead his children into temptation? Let's speak this prayer this morning. Stand, if you will, and let's speak it together. Call the Lord's Prayer. It was actually the Lord's teaching of the disciples to pray. And... I think we need to pray it more than we do. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, we thank you now for teaching us how to pray and for teaching us how to listen to you. Lord, prayer is a two-way avenue. We speak and you listen. Help us to listen while you speak in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. In the original text, for thine is the kingdom of the power and the glory forever, amen, was not included. But as I understand, as I've studied scripture and theology, this probably was not the only time Jesus prayed that prayer, teaching them how to pray. It may have been added, that last little phrase, as a benediction and by the early church. There are a lot of ways to look at this. But the truth of all this is still very important. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us for evil, for thine is the kingdom. So if we tie that together, rather than just being a benediction, we can see that the power of God, the kingdom of God, and the glory of God are tied to the deliverance of God. If we pray, lead us not into temptation, does that mean that God might lead us into temptation in certain circumstances? Why would God deliberately lead his children into something that he warns them to stay away from? Uh, so the answer is no, or yes, or maybe. Where are you in that? James 1, 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Now the word trials and temptations are sometimes used interchangeably in various translations. The Greek word for trials is the same word used, Greek word, as temptation in Matthew 6. And the meaning of James 1, 2 through 4 goes like this. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance or perseverance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your perseverance, endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So James is telling us that some of these trials and difficulties we have in our life produce spiritual maturity. 
Do we understand that? Do we want to simply avoid it all? Do we want to stay away from it? See, one point's clear to understand. God does not solicit his children to do evil. Nowhere in the word does it say that God will lead you to do evil. James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God will not lure you into evil. He will not seduce you into evil. Not his plan, not his will, not his personality, not his character. In that sense, God will never tempt you to do what's wrong. God will not deliberately bring you into evil. He will never lead you to a place where you're forced to do evil. You may find yourself in a tough situation. Under pressure, you may choose to do evil. But God didn't lead you to that point and pursue you to do that very thing. The choice is yours, not God's. Always. Said another way, I guess you could say, God never sets us up to fail. He never puts you in a place where he expects you to fail. If there's a place where he puts you, he expects you to succeed because you know who he is. You know, we did the study on Wednesday night a while back about uh, being overcomers, and we talked a lot about uh, the captivity in Babylon where Israel was captive and taken captive to Babylon. And we talked about the fact that God used a pagan king to take them there, and God taught them many lessons while they were there, testing their faith to believe him, moving them away from idolatry, and in the end result, used a pagan king to set them free. So God will use all kinds of people and events and situations and circumstances to bring us to the place sometimes where he wants us to to be and to do what he wants us to do. So if the question is, does God lead his children into temptation? For me, the answer is always no. Temptation to do evil, put us in a place where he expects us to do it. No, he is not the tempter. He is the deliverer. This is what we fail to understand. I do not believe God sends sickness, lack, pain into your life to tempt you to sin and to doubt. God doesn't send our troubles. He delivers us out of our troubles. If God was the trouble sender to teach us lessons, how do I know when the lesson is over so I can ask him to deliver me from what he sent to me? I'm confused by that. I believe God's the deliverer. I believe God sets us free. I believe there are things that come into our lives that are tests. But how many of you ever took a test in school where the teacher taught you through the test? No. The test was simply to find out what you already knew, to find out what you had been taught and what you had received. That test would come to see if your faith was strong. And this is what we're talking about here. Is he at once both tempter and deliverer? I think not. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I'm not coming to tempt you to do sin and to doubt and have unbelief in your life. So what's the answer to this conundrum? I mean, when we think about it, what's the solution to this curious phrase, a couple of phrases in the Lord's Prayer? I think this is key to understanding part of this. What God allows as a trial or a test, Satan uses as temptation. So when we realize that that God will allow things to come to our our lives as tests for us. Satan wants to take that and try to tempt us to hate God, to to be angry at God, to be bitter at God, uh, to be bitter at others, to have attitudes and ideas that come into our mind that, that cause us to sin. What Satan, though, means for your destruction, as Joseph told us in the Word. What Satan meant for for harm for you, God means for good. The very things that Satan thinks he's got you If you continue looking to God in faith, you'll find the answer to the very thing. The destruction that Satan meant becomes a brand new building, a brand new, not not just refurbished, but a brand new creation, a creative miracle of God. While Satan's working through situations and events, trying to accomplish his diabolical purposes, while he's doing that, God's working right in the middle of it where you can't see it to build something in your life that is so creative and so powerful. Look, we don't see what God's doing. It would be wonderful if God just unveiled it all, but it would scare us to death. Because when our faith is strong, when in the midst of every event and trial and struggle and, and trouble, when we stay strong in faith, God's working behind the scenes where we can't see it. And on the day when that is revealed, it'll, it's like uh, extreme home makeover. 
You fall on your knees and tears in your eyes and your hands are in the air and you go, God, I didn't know you were doing that. I knew you were doing something, but I had no idea this was what you had planned for me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Matthew 4, 1 said, even Jesus was tempted. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's interesting to me. This is a clear example of what I'm talking about. Three different occasions, the devil tempted him to turn away from the path that he was on, the path of obedience that the heavenly father had set him on. And it says he was led up to the, by the spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Who did the leading? Spirit of God. Who did the tempting? The devil. There's, there's no contradiction here. Not at all. God, God knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing when Jesus came. And when he sent the son into the desert or allowed him to go there being tempted by the, the, by the enemy, uh, God understood. This is the test that we have. Jesus had to be tested. He, he was born as a man, God man, stripped himself of his godness to become a man. And he had to be tempted like we are or he couldn't have fulfilled what was fulfilled at the cross. He had to experience what we experience. And he didn't fail. And this is the point. Was God putting his son in a place where he could be tempted by the devil? Yes, absolutely. Is God responsible for severe failures when we're tempted? No, he's not. Has he allowed us to be put in that place? God does the leading. Satan does the tempting. From God's point of view, it's a test. From Satan's point of view, it's a temptation. They're a normal part of the Christian life. There's going to be difficult choices in front of every one of us almost every day. We have to make choices based in the word by following him and trusting him in the circumstances that you don't understand, your faith becomes stronger. You begin to understand and to listen and to know what it is that God wants you to know. You become an example to other people of victory all over the world, the victory over the flesh and the devil and the world because of who God is in you. This is the thing that we have to understand. God wants us to be the shining light in a dark world because of what we've been through so we can tell others how victorious God is in our lives. Nothing you can do to escape it. It's just a part of life. It's the way it is. In the school of grace, there is a, there's not a no trials degree. <laughs> there will be struggles along the way, but Jesus was clear. Be a good cheer. You're going to have some trouble, but I've overcome the world. Trust in me. Rely on me. Line up with me. Take hold of me. Embrace me and my word, and you'll see. We've all said, except for the grace of God, when we see somebody who's failed, except for the grace of God, there go I. We've all said that, haven't we? I mean, you think that. I've said it to myself many times. And it's perfectly true. We can all take a lesson from the mistakes of others. I mean, and if we don't, we, we'll probably find ourselves wishing that we did. Uh, those who don't learn from the past are destined to repeat it. You know that. If we don't learn from our mistakes and the mistakes of others, we will repeat those same mistakes. John Newton put it in his great song, Amazing Grace. There are many dangers, toils, and snares along this road, but I have already overcome the amazing grace of God. It's only the amazing grace of God that keeps us safe. It's only the amazing grace. And when you pray, lead us not into temptation. You're expressing your own weakness. Listen, I don't know about you, but I'm weak. My flesh is weak. If I was left to my own devices... I would be an abject, utter failure consistently. That's why I'm glad I've got Carol to keep me on the straight road. <laughs> she does a good job of it. And, and Carol, yeah, she's, she's tuned in with the Holy Ghost, so she can tell me. But for every one of us, we, we need guidance. We need protection. We need the Holy Spirit walking alongside us. And we're just simply saying, Lord, by myself, I can't do it. I can't do it alone. I, I can't do it without your help. When you pray, deliver us from evil, then you declare your confidence in God's power. See, uh, lead us not to temptation. You're saying, God, I'm weak. I, I can't do it on my own. Deliver us from evil, says God, I trust in you. That's how those two tie together. 
Lord, we know you're not going to lead us into a place where we're going to fail. That's not your purpose in us. But the tempter is out there. He is going to try to distract us, destroy us, defeat us in every way. He wants to take the, the foundation out from under us and cause us to fail. But deliver us from evil, the evil one, evil that's in the world. This is my trust in you, God. So the first half declares our weakness, and the second half declares God's power in our weakness. Hallelujah. So is this a prayer for cowards? <laughs> Lead us not to temptation, I'm scared. No. This is a prayer for people who were too frightened uh, uh, about their own life to, to do spiritual warfare on their own. There's a people who've learned what the Word of God says. Was Jesus a coward? The answer is no. Well, Matthew 26 tells us that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that? He prayed. He sweat as if it were great drops of blood, begged God to let this pass from him. He wasn't a coward. He was simply saying, God, I can't do it on my own. I've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit working in me. The Bible said he prayed loud. You ever pray loud? With tears, crying out, groaning. He was the son of God. Yet in this moment of trial, he didn't boast of his own power. And yet some Christians say, I got this. Don't worry about me, I'll be okay. The victory of Calvary wasn't won on Sunday morning. It was won on Thursday night. Think about it with me. Yes, he came out of the tomb on Sunday morning. Yes, he said it is finished on Friday. But it was in that time of prayer when he won the victory. The battle was won on Thursday. When he submitted and released all of his flesh, all of his desires, all of his wants, needs, his pain, he said, God, I trust you. I'm going to give this to you. The battle was won before Judas ever planted the first kiss. The battle was won before one spike was ever nailed into those precious hands. The battle was won before he came out of the tomb. When he prayed that prayer of submission, not my will, but thine be done, the battle was won. And when we learn to pray that, when we truly give it to God, release it to him and say, my flesh is weak, Lord, but I know the spirit is strong and I want your spirit to control my life. Coming out, it says in Luke 22, he went to the Mount of Olives and he was, as he was accustomed, that means he prayed a lot. That means he went there to get alone with God. That means this wasn't the first time he did battle with the enemy. This means that it was a, he was accustomed to it. It was a normal procedure and process in his daily life. How about you? When you run into crisis, when you run into to times when your world is coming apart, is that the first time in months that you've gotten on your knees and said, God, i got to have your help? This is as he was accustomed and his disciples followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Interesting line, isn't it? He knew that temptation is real. Jesus knew that they would be tempted with the flesh. And then he went off by himself and earnestly prayed to God. And then he came back and you know what happened? He found him asleep. And he said in verse 46, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. Jesus' words to the disciples and his words to us are the same and they're simple words. Before you face what the world has to offer tomorrow, this afternoon, next week, you got to get on your knees. You got to tune in with God. You got to make sure that you prayed. You got to be sure that you have connected with Him. Pray that you may not fall into temptation. That is our prayer. Lord, lead us not toward temptation into a place where we can be tempted to fail. Deliver us from evil. And the battles have won in avoiding temptation. When you get to the place where you know where your source of strength is. It's not in you, not in your mental ability, not in your training, in your theological knowledge, not in your family, not in your pastor. It's in you and God. It is a connection that has to happen. When you pray, lead me not into temptation. You're admitting your fleshly weakness, but you're also calling, as you say, deliver us from evil. That God, it takes you. I can't do this by myself. Post some over to pray. Go ahead, Lord. Let me have it. I can handle it. I'm strong. I'm ready. And take on the devil. There are a lot of proud Christians, you know, who think they're that strong. Hey, I got a lot of word knowledge. Got a lot of faith. I'm strong. Devil, you can't defeat me. Watch this. There they go. 
because they haven't been connected. They, they, they don't have any power. They have the right words. They have the right knowledge. They have the right uh, training. They, they've, they've heard all the CDs. They've been to all the church services and the, and the big events, and they, they've been healed and delivered from things, and, and God has blessed them, but they have nothing inside. There's nothing working in them. It's not consistent, and they try to fight it on their own because of their past. The devil knows all about your past. And let me tell you something. You won't, you won't always be hit in your weakest place. Listen to me now. This is important. Satan wants something from you. When we are tempted, it's not always in the place of weakness because we're on guard against that. We know where we're weak, don't we? We know where we've failed in the past. We know what we're not able to accomplish on our own. It's just kind of where we live. We, we know that. And so we're kind of on guard there. You know, if you've if you've been an addict to anything, you know that you can't go back to that place where you were. You can't trigger those memories that, that cause that to come up in you. You need to stay away from that. And, and so it's that way with us. When we failed, when we were a failure in some area of our life, we need to stay away from that. And we're on guard against that. Look, look what it says here in Luke 22, 32. Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I prayed for you, Simon, this is Peter, that your faith may not fail. What did Jesus know about him? And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus called his name three times as if to kind of reassure him that in the midst of his greatest failure, the Lord will still be there for him. See, the, the devil wants something from us and, and so does God. In that moment of temptation, Satan wants to destroy us and God wants to deliver us. They got two different ideas about that moment when you're on the precipice. What are you going to do about that? Sometimes Christians get frozen in fear because they, they've they given Satan too much credit. Well, well, the devil did this to me and the devil boxed me in over here and the devil did this. And I don't hear him talk about God much. Instead of deliverance, they're talking about what the devil did. We, we kind of talk as if Satan were a junior God, you know, that he was just right under God. But... He, he was revealed as a, a creature of God's creation. He only has the power God gives him. And in your life, Satan only has the power when you agree with him. And you're agreeing with Satan and what the world says and what the kingdom of this world says, you're going to give him power in your life. He has no power independent of God, independent of your agreement with what he's trying to say into your life. He can only do what God permits him to do and what you allow him to do in your life. You can open the door. You can let him do whatever he wants to do if that's your deal. See, but, but Satan, back to my point, Satan really attacks us at the point of our perceived strength, not always at the point of our weakness. When we think we've got it, I mean, if you'd asked Peter six hours earlier about that denial around that fire, he would have said, I got this. I'm strong. I'll never. He even told Jesus that. If they all fall away, not me, I'm with you. That was in Mark 14, 29. He said, if they all fall, I won't. I'm, I'm strong, Lord. I, I'm, I, got, I got your back, Lord. I tell it, you know, he's, he, he might have said, you know, sometimes I put my foot in my mouth, but I'm not afraid to speak up, you know. I mean, I'll tell you like it is because that's just the way I am. And Jesus, you know I'll be there. When you need me, I won't fail you, Lord. But it, it came so suddenly and so swiftly. It's like Simon Peter turned to butter. Like all that strength just melted away. And by himself, he was helpless. In the moment of crisis, Peter failed at the very point where he had pledged in his own flesh that he would not fail. Be careful, folks. Be careful. In Luke twenty two fifty four. Then it says, but Peter followed at a distance. Now listen to me. He's made this great claim. I'm going to be by your side. No matter what happens, I got your back. And then it says, Peter followed at a distance. He allowed some space to come because his flesh said, ooh, what they're doing to him, they might do to you. See, there's a certain mentality. There's this spirit of fear that attaches itself to those of us who follow at a distance. Uh, our, our weakness begins to show. 
Luke twenty two fifty five said, Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. It goes on to say that he stood around the coals of fire with those who didn't believe. And Peter was recognized by a servant girl. You all know this story, right? And he was filled with fear. He denied even knowing Jesus. And he did it three times. I think one problem Peter had, he followed at a distance. And then he chose to warm himself by somebody else's fire. Don't warm yourself with somebody else's fire. Don't follow at a distance. He was intimidated by the voices around him. He was afraid of what they might think of him or what they might do to him if they found out that he was a close follower of Jesus. And then while hanging around somebody else's fire, he denied Jesus three times. We don't need somebody else's fire. We need fresh fire. We need fire built by the Holy Spirit inside every one of us. We need a heavenly invasion of the fresh fire of God inside each one of us individually. You can't get it from me. You don't need to hang around my fire. You need your own fire. You need the fire of the Holy Spirit working in you. You don't need to follow Jesus at a distance. And the closer you get to him, the more fresh fire you're going to have. And the fresh fire is going to burn inside you. And it's going it's to spill out of you. You won't be able to keep what you know about Jesus inside. You won't deny him when you're following close and when you've got the fire of God burning in you. Hmm. You know, we see strong Christians sometimes. We see them face a spiritual defeat and we say, I would have expected that to happen to anybody but him. Hmm. I'm sure they said that about Peter. Those who knew him well. I, I, I wouldn't have expected Peter to... Uh, that's an unusual surprise to know what he did. But the devil caught Peter in a vulnerable moment. It was swift. It was quick. And he hit him in a strong spot. The thing that Peter thought about himself proved not to be true at all. But he was following at a distance. He was warming himself with somebody else's fire. Ephesians 6.12 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our flesh is weak. We, we war against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. There will always be the pressure to conform for you. Always. They always want you to conform. We read a thing this week. I shared it with the office about Duck Dynasty. How many know what Duck Dynasty? Wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Okay. The, the most watched, highest rated cable television program of all time is Duck Dynasty. And when, when these guys were out looking for someone to do a program about a reality show, the, somebody brought in this idea. What about the, what about these guys? They're multimillionaires off duck calls and, you know, they're, they got beers, but they're wealthy. They're multimillionaires. And so they went to them and talked about it and they said, sure, we'll try that. And so they, they went and they told them in the beginning, they said, now, uh, whatever you want to do is fine. And they said, well, we always want to pray because we're Christians. And they said, okay, fine. So they came back to them after the first season. Now this thing is really blown up and it's huge. And they're saying to them, look, if you could just minimize this prayer thing, if you could not talk about your faith as much, if you could just kind of not deal with that as much, and Phil, the father, said, look, we don't need you. We're already rich. And we're going to talk about Jesus on this program. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you stand strong, and tall. And, and, and they were also putting some, uh, and, and they said they're going to quit that. They also put some bleeps in and they wanted them to take it to the edge on all kinds of uh, themes on the show. And they, they bleep words that aren't words. It was, it was documented in there. The words they were saying were not bad words. It's just that they found a place to bleep to made it seem like they were saying bad words. So they, because they wanted to, they wanted to minimize their faith to the point where they seemed like just regular everybody else. You know what the devil wants? He wants you to be like everybody else. He just wants you to be, he don't want you to be you. He don't want you to be strong. He don't want you to be uh, filled with faith and power and the spirit of God. He just wants you to be regular. There's always pressure to conform, always in every area of our lives. If you work with people who aren't Christians, they want you to conform. They don't, they don't want you talking about Jesus. So, Sometimes a healthy concern for what others think is an asset, but Peter went beyond this. He crumbled under the pressure. Should this surprise us that people do this? No. 
Satan attacks us at our point of strength. We crumble under the pressure. And you say, well, that's not a problem for me. Well, yes, it is. Everything is a problem for you, no matter how weak or how strong it is in your life. Everything is a problem when you follow at a distance. Everything is a problem when you're warming yourself with somebody else's fire. Everything is a problem. So this happened to Peter. It could happen to you or me sooner or later. But do you notice how Jesus approached this? He never criticized him. Never gave up on him. Actually, Jesus had more faith in Peter than Peter had in Jesus. You know, Jesus believes in you more than you probably believe in yourself. God wants you to be the you that he designed and created you to be. God wants you to have the power of God working in you so much that he is willing to wait on you to get there. He is willing to wrap his arms around you and pull you toward the Holy Spirit power. He is willing to constantly say to you, I'm drawing you back in. He, he, he wants you to hear that message on television. He wants you to hear this message today. He wants you to know that he loves you beyond measure. He loves you no matter what you've done, no matter how deep your sin, no matter where you've come from, what your addictions have been. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He will not give up on you. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. Who's ever phone that is, go ahead and answer it. Tell them they need to be here next Sunday. <laughs> and stop calling you during church. <laughs> You're busy. We can wait. My phone rang on a Wednesday night in my pocket. I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I can't take this right now. I'm preaching. <laughs> it happened about three months ago. It was a telemarketer. <laughs> Listen, God uses broken people to accomplish his purposes. You want to take a roll call of the saints? You don't believe me? <laughs> Noah got drunk. Abraham lied about his wife. Jacob was a deceiver. Moses was a murderer. David was an adulterer. Rahab was a harlot. Paul persecuted the church. Peter denied Christ. We could go on and on throughout the, the whole word of God and we find people just like us who failed miserably, but God loved them anyway and used them and they ended up in the hall of faith. Yes. Glory to God. We're all broken people. We're all broken people. Not a one of us sitting in here can look down on another. We don't judge in this church. We don't condemn in this church. You come in with purple hair and 12 earrings, that's okay. We catch them, God cleans them. That's all right with me. We just want God to take care of his business. We're going to take care of our business and he'll take care of his. Look, we're all tempted. And a man who gives into temptation never finds out what the strength is of standing tall. I mean, you don't find the strength of an army by surrendering. <laughs> and you don't find the strength of the wind we got today by, by lying down. You got to walk against it to find out how strong it is. And if you give in five minutes into temptation, you don't know what it would have been like to stand strong and tall for an hour and what that hour would be like at the end of that hour and that day and that week and that month and that year. Jesus never yielded to temptation. He is our example. He is the only one who knows what it means never to yield. The fact is, we're all sinners saved by the grace of God. We've all sinned and come short of his glory. But, and we got to remember, either we overcome by grace or we don't overcome at all. It is the grace of God. It is not anything having to do with what we are able to do. Because Jesus knows how sinful we really are. We don't have to play games when we pray either. We just got to come to God the way we are. We got to give it all up, folks, and say, look, you already know me. Why am I pretending? Why am I trying to put on a face? Why am I trying to play a game? You know who I am. I'm going to cling to the cross and claim nothing but the blood of Jesus over my life, and I'm going to live for you, and I'm going to walk with you, and when I fail, your grace is going to pick me up and make me clean again. Glory to God. This is the kind of God we serve. Sometimes we try to fool God. Isn't that amazing? Try to fool God. Oh, God, I'm really very, very holy and pious. And God's going, <laughs> yeah, really? really? You think I don't know you? 
Stop playing games. Get real with God. He knows you. Other people might not. You might have put on the face long enough that they think you're really something. But you know you're not. I know I'm not. I know that God loves me, though. And he loves me so much that he sent his precious son to die for me. Wow. When you put it in that context and get honest before God, God can work in an honest life. He can't work in a proud life. He can't work in a life filled with pride and fake religiosity. God hates religion. Religion and tradition where it just has to be certain ways. You know, this thing we say around here that really is in my heart every day. God, I just want to get out of your way so you can do what you want to do. I know I'm the pastor. I know I preach and, you know, I'm up here. But that's not the real deal. I used to love it when my dad couldn't preach when I was a kid. And the Holy Spirit would move in and take over. Well, I, I had the wrong reason. I just got tired of sermons. I'd lived in them all my life. <laughs> but now I understand. If we don't have a sermon, it's no big deal if the Holy Spirit's taken over. That's what we ought to long for. More of Him and less of us. That's what Jesus said. Not my will. Not my way. Not my agenda. Not my bulletin. <laughs> Lord, let something happen that's not in the bulletin. <laughs> we just want to get out of God's way. Do you want to do that in your life? Or do you want to keep going to him in your prayer life pretending? See, when you're a pretender, there's an imposter who's taken over your life, and you go to pray, God doesn't see anybody there because it's not the real you. So you can pray all day long pretending. And God doesn't see you because you're not there. You're, you're letting this imposter, this pretender that's taken you over, that everybody else knows, pious, righteous, holy, good, special, never does anything wrong. Sometimes we wrap ourselves in that rag righteousness and God doesn't even see who we are. We got to come before him in such a way that we say, Lord, lead us not to temptation. Deliver me from evil, which is sometimes me. Some of the greatest evil in our lives is us. I'm my own worst enemy too much of the time. I allow those things that I've pushed down and pretended weren't there. I've pushed them down so long, I think I, I, I fool myself. Can we quit doing that? Can we get so real before God that we say, God, I am worthless. I'm a sinner saved by grace. If it weren't for your grace, I'd be nothing. I could never do anything or be anything. And I, and I choose to submit myself to you in such a way. That's really what Jesus was saying. I mean, they, uh, they adored him. They honored him. They praised him as he walked with the palm leaves and on the donkey. And he came into the town, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And when he got to the garden of Gethsemane, he had to strip all that away. And say, Father, not my will. It's not who I am, not what I want. Just want your will. That's where we need to get, folks. Can I challenge you? Can I challenge you? The next time you get on your knees to pray, and it might be here in just a moment, you just strip all that away. You may know everything about the Bible. You may, you may have had experiences like none of us have had. You may have had great things happen in your life. I have said this before, and this is not to pat myself on the back. I've been a lot of places and done a lot of stuff. Carol and I have been blessed beyond measure. Singing with great groups, uh, Billy Graham crusades, all that. Listen, none of that matters to God. I mean, he blessed us with that. None of that matters to God when I come before him. I strip all that away. Dino's had accolades and awards and stuff. None of that matters to God. God's not enamored by how good he plays the piano or how good a cake he bakes. Either one of those. God's just not impressed by that. God's not impressed by your stuff either. God just wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your life. He wants your past. He wants your present. And he wants your future. And when we give that to him, he is happy. Happy, 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 as they say on Duck Dynasty. <laughs> you want to make God happy? Give him your life.
Turn it all over to him. Say, God, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I don't care what it is. When we do that, God's happy, happy, happy. He is thrilled because that's why Jesus came. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah.